Well, good morning. Thank you. I'm Carol Reynolds. Thank you for being here and finding the room and uh, joining us for this session. The topic is before you. I think you'll find the variety of what is on this panel uh, to be utterly delightful. I uh, will introduce Dave Mason first. I was going to make some comments, but you know what? We have a very tight schedule, and I think there's so much to be offering that we need to go right to it, and we are ready to go. David Mason, many of you may know him, Professor David Mason. Uh, he teaches at Colorado College and has been Poet Laureate of Colorado, uh, which to me is just the coolest thing. I, I have to say, I don't know a lot of Poet Laureates. Perhaps you do, but I don't. Um, and if you begin to see the list of publications and the list of collections of poetry, um, it's it, beyond intriguing, particularly his themes, which tend to deal with American American culture and history, the West, nature, uh, storytelling, and the thing he will focus on today, which is going to come up later this afternoon, he will tell you also in a session, which is this extraordinary novel in verse in the in the tradition of Pushkin and Byron, and, and which, I mean, again, how many people do you know writing novels in verse these days? But he has done it with Ludlow, bringing out a, an epic uh, or an episode out of our American history that I was totally unaware of, and perhaps you know, perhaps you do not, and the thing that also struck me not only the success and the comments about this and the reception of his novel in verse on this horrific event in 1913-1914 in our American history, but it has also been picked up into operatic form because he works as a librettist also and has worked on librettos for The Scarlet Letter and also Ludlow. We will be exposed to that later this afternoon. His own background, um, training particularly his PhD at University of Rochester, he probably teaches across all kinds of borders and all kinds of lines because you cannot be involved this much beauty and this much excitement and adventure if you are not versed in all of these fields. I'm very delighted to be able to introduce to you Dr. David Mason. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. There is another uh, verse novelist or epic poet in the audience. I think I saw him. There it is, Frederick Turner. And Fred and I will be part of a group of poets and musicians performing this afternoon at 4.30, I assume downstairs where the folk singers were last night. We're going to have some folk music, some poetry, and we're also going to have one aria from the opera version of Ludlow that's, uh, that's in progress. If you don't mind, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this technological part of my talk as fast as I can so that I don't have to worry about it anymore, and then I can just talk about a few ideas and a few of the things I'm working on in an essay version of this, a longer essay version. So first of all, uh, how many people here have heard of the Ludlow Massacre as an incident in American history? Just one person, or two. That's kind of typical, uh, and it's even typical in Colorado, although for the 100th anniversary of the Ludlow Massacre in 1914, um, the governor of Colorado did institute a, a certain uh, set of, a, a committee of people who uh, worked on commemoration of the event. The event is something that's, that's particularly important in American labor history, but from my own point of view, it's actually kind of a, a microcosm of modern American history altogether. It's really a fascinating moment. If you go into the cemeteries in southern Colorado, you will find the graves of people from almost every nationality and every racial background uh, on the planet Earth. Uh, and a lot of Coloradans don't even know that. So what happens is that um, uh, more than 20 different nationalities are working in the coal mines in southern Colorado in 1913. The United Mine Workers, which is not a choir of angels, a uh, pretty ruthless group of people, uh, are infiltrating the workers. Uh, and between the kind of violent infiltration of the union and the uh, excessive violence of the company owners, uh, who hired the private detectives and uh, made use of a local corrupt sheriff, et cetera. There's a lot of violence on both sides. And a lot of shooting starts happening in the fall of 1913. The governor calls out the National Guard. The National Guard tries to keep peace between the two sides for a, a few months. And then the state of Colorado uh, finds itself unable to pay their salaries. They were bankrupt. Democratic governor named Ammons uh, was a, a little bit um, weak-willed in the, in the course of managing this whole event, although Woodrow Wilson, newly elected president, is watching it all in Washington. 
Uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. is getting all the news in Manhattan. This is in the newspapers in New York and Chicago and everywhere in the United States. What's happening is this intense tension and violence between immigrants from more than 20 different nationalities and the established powers in southern Colorado. So you go into a, a train station in Pueblo, Colorado in 1912, you'll see a sign on the wall that says, this waiting room is for Americans only, no Italians, no Mexicans, no Greeks. See, what's, see the little distinction that's going on there? Um, racial hatred was part of it. Ethnic hatred was part of it. Economic paranoia was part of it. But you can also see that this is really indicative of a lot of different stages in American history. Uh, there's a kind of microcosm at work here. Corporate power is invested in maximizing profits out of the coal mines, and um, institutions like the eight-hour day don't exist, uh, fair pay in, in cash that you can spend anywhere, that doesn't exist. You're paid in company script that you can only spend in the company stores. No pay for doing the work that keeps you safe in the mines, what they call dead work. Um, you know, doing all the buttressing and the building of supports in the mines, no pay for that. So if you want to keep yourself safe in the mines, it's all off your own back. Uh, and they were the most dangerous mines in the world at the time. And in one mine explosion uh, in Dawson, northern New Mexico, October 2013, uh, 263 uh, miners were killed in one explosion, mostly young Italians. Um, and their graves are visible there in Dawson. Uh, under the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. There's the, the gist of it in, an, in a nutshell. In the spring, um, the, the militia is whittled down to two companies who are camped next to the striking miners. Um, the racial hatred between them is intense. A lot of the militia folks had fought in Mexico and fought in the Philippines and had their own attitudes about dark-skinned people. That's a fact. Um, and um, uh, in, on April 20th, right after the Greek Orthodox Easter, in which the, the Greek miners and the Cretan miners in the camp managed to steal a few sheep from local ranchers and celebrate the resurrection of Christ over the weekend, uh, and a baseball game was played on, on Holy Sunday. Uh, the Monday morning after that, a pitched battle broke out, and in the course of the day, more than 20 people were killed. The camp was burned, uh, and 13 women and children um, suffocated in a pit under one of the tents. So this became obviously big propaganda value for the Union, um, major, major part of American labor history, and something of great contention. Congressional hearings were held on this, Rockefeller was testifying, Union people were testifying, etc. So here's, here's my connection to it. My grandfather, George Mason, was a businessman in Trinidad, Colorado, about 12 miles south of the, the massacre site. This is where my father grew up. This is a letter George wrote to somebody in Aguilar, a little town just north of the battle site. Uh, you can see George, had, he'd started a creamery, uh, and he used to make Mason's ice cream, and their ad said, Mason's ice cream better than the law requires. <laughs> because Mason's ice cream was made with 20% butter fat, you know? So anyway, they, they turned it into a candy company, and you can see purity and cleanliness are a hobby, right? Chocolates make friends, etc. But what George is writing to this man about is the mineral rights to a certain plot of land near Aguilar. He's interested in renting the land, investing in it, and I do not know uh, the outcome of that business deal. That's 1911, three years before the massacre. This is a famous old photo of people in, in the, the strikers' camp, um, immigrants in the camp. The camp was huge, more than a more than thousand people in that one camp at Ludlow, and there were a handful of camps in the region. Um, and um, very sophisticated uh, organization of people in the camp, et cetera. This is a bunch of people running the operation. This is a union leader, John Lawson. I met a man in western Colorado who remembers sitting in John Lawson's lap when he was a little boy. Uh, <laughs> and he, I said, what was his voice like? And he just said, deep, rough. Uh, this is Elias Spandidakis, Louis Tikas, who was born in, in a little village called Lutra, near Rethymnon in Crete, uh, and was 28 years old at the time of the Ludlow Massacre when the Colorado militia, he had just become an American citizen, Colorado militia shot him in the back that day and killed him. Um, and uh, the monument at Ludlow is an interesting historical 
piece of uh, information because it gets his age wrong. It says he was 30 years old, uh, and a man named Zis Papa Nicholas has done all the research and figured out that Louis was 28. That's a guy named Harlan who had later became mayor of Seattle. So you, can, you get some sense of how mobile people were in the West. There's uh, the famous um, uh, uh, Irish rabble-rouser, Mother Jones. Uh, this is a guy named Horace Hawkins, who's a union lawyer, and that's John Lawson over there. So what we have here is information, right? This is General John Chase, a Denver ophthalmologist who was in command of the units of the National Guard at the time of the massacre. That's him riding in on Main Street in Trinidad, and it may be just before this, which is a moment in which the militia made the absolutely stupid mistake of charging on horseback a bunch of striking miners who were protesting the incarceration of Mother Jones. General John Chase is said to have uh, been so outraged by the, by the strikers that um, when a, a young teenage uh, striker taunted him, he reared up his horse, fell off his horse, and embarrassed himself in the street. Anyway, that's right in front of the post office in Trinidad. This is the aftermath of the, of the massacre, or what one journalist calls a battle, because he points out that the, the militia troops may very well have set the fire, and most commentators and historians agree that they set the fire. That was one of their strategies for clearing the camps. Um, but they wouldn't have known that women and children were in a pit underneath one of the tents, so it wasn't an intentional killing of, uh, of women and children. Uh, instead, they were, isn't that that wonderful term, collateral damage? A uh, bunch of soldiers horsing around after the massacre. Famous old photo of the aftermath. That's the death pit where the women and children were killed. And if you go to the Ludlow site, just north of Trinidad now, the Union maintains it. So the Union keeps its version of the story um, on display there. And you'll see little notebooks where people from all over the world know about this massacre. Greeks, Russians, etc. They all know about Ludlow. Americans don't know about it. That's the interesting thing. This is one of the this guy named Frank Robino who was killed in the massacre. There are autopsy photos of a lot of the victims. The children uh, in a Catholic um, funeral procession. The funeral procession of Louis Ticas in Trinidad. Um, and I'll tell you about an incident down there. Uh, this is Commercial Street. Right across the bridge, before the strike, there was a shootout where a union guy named Gerald Lippiat was killed. Uh, and I write about it from the point of view of, of a fictional character who lives on this side of the bridge. And she goes running over there to find out what's happening uh, on the other side of the bridge. That's John Lawson as an old man. That's a photo of somebody nobody knows. Uh, this is a photographer who later photographed my father and his brothers in Trinidad. Um, and in his archive, there's just an, an amazing array of photographs. This is an anonymous girl. Notice that he photographed the girl, and then he took, made a tiny print of it, pinned it to his easel, and photographed the photograph. So that's my emblem in my book of history. Right? A photograph of a photograph of a photograph. Right? Where am I coming from? I'm coming from the fact that traditionally the muse of history, Cleo, and the muse of epic poetry have the same mother. Calliope and Cleo have the same mother. Their mother is Nemosini, memory. Right? History and poetry were one of, or two of nine sisters famous for their beautiful singing and their dancing. History was just as famous for singing beautifully as epic poetry, lyric poetry, music, dance, etc. Right? Um, so in, in their original uh, conception, uh, history and poetry are, are kind of equals. And I'm pointing out that it's actually historically a rather strange phenomenon, that particularly since the Renaissance and on to our age, they've become such separate Age. They become like a dysfunctional family, right? And there's a sibling rivalry between history and poetry. And we go back and forth in time where we place them hierarchically in different places. Sir Philip Sidney says, well, history is just hearsay, and he places it lower in the pecking order and places poetry at the top of all kinds of knowledge. Because among other things, poetry creates a kind of music that makes more difficult kinds of knowledge easier to absorb, etc. 
Um, so, uh, you know, that's a hierarchical notion. You get into, the, you get into our era, and uh, I think most people would, would stick to their notion of factual truth and would place uh, history higher on the, uh, on the pecking order and, um, and uh, poetry somewhat below it, poetry being considered something that's entirely fictional. But I think as we're beginning to see in multiple talks in this conference, um, degrees of fact and degrees of truth are often debatable. And we, we are talking about stories. Herodotus calls his histories uh, researches or investigations, depending on how you translate the Greek. The modern Greek word, historias, is, is uh, just story. That's all it means. Um, and so I'm arguing that it behooves us, however we fall on this hierarchical scale, to remember that the two are related and that memory is imaginative. Um, Hobbes says this in Leviathan, that memory and imagination are really two sides of the same thing. The only thing you need to know to, to demonstrate that really is um, uh, just to remember your own family arguments and uh, your version of it versus a sibling's version of it, right? You're going to understand that something happened over, over the dinner table that night, but your story of it and your sister's story of it or your brother's story of it are entirely different or different in particulars, right? So we understand that memory and imagination are involved in fiction. Now, let me just really quickly uh, get to, I'll tell you what, I'll get to one excerpt from the book. Um, uh, in my essay, I'm referring to um, two nonfiction accounts of these events, one by Zis Papa Nicholas, who did the research on Louis Ticus, the other by a man named Scott Martell, who was a Los Angeles Times reporter and, you know, trained in um, journalistic expertise, uh, where, among other things, you are supposed to have three sources for every fact you want to you say is a fact, right? You need to triangulate your information and establish uh, that we can say the weather was such and such on that day, we can say the sun rose at that, at that time on that day, etc. So, I'm just telling you about a shootout. I'll go back to the bridge. Oh, by the way, one more picture. That's the house in Crete where Louis Ticus was born. I visited there some years ago. And the Greeks know all about him because they've put a plaque up there about Ticus saying he was killed in Colorado in 1914. There's the bridge. So, Scott Martell, the journalist, writes his account of how Gerald Lippiat arrives in Trinidad in August 1913, and the, he knows he's in trouble because he's a union organizer and the town is full of armed detectives uh, who are uh, usually beating up mine workers, um, abusing mine workers, and quite willing to kill any union man who's caught in town. So uh, he's heading to the union office across that bridge there uh, when he runs into a bunch of detectives, a guy named Belcher and some other folks. They start an argument, guns are drawn, uh, Lippiet goes down in a hail of bullets and uh, manages to wound one of the detectives in the knee. Um, and, and that's it. Those are the facts. Scott begins his book there, establishes that as the scene in which what you understand is that this, this intense hatred is breaking out in southern Colorado. And the sides are all heavily armed. Nobody's an angel. Nobody's innocent. Um, and uh, the people who are going to be led into this strike are going to be in serious trouble pretty soon um, because uh, they're surrounded by armed people who have their own motives for doing what they're doing. I'm writing as a poet and um, there's, a, there's a Greek scholar who's written about my book and he points out that one of the things I'm doing uh, and one of the things we can say Shakespeare does in his history plays, etc., is that we are imagining the inner lives of our characters. And, um, and in fact, we are making a tenable and believable inner life for our characters, which happens to be something that escapes the historical archive altogether, um, unless you can find certain kinds of evidence that suggest inner life, like letters, etc. Uh, so when I imagine my Louis Ticus, my historical character, uh, I give him a, a pretty complex psychology that comes from my own knowledge of living among Greeks much of my life, speaking Greek, 
knowing a lot about Greek immigrants, etc., having you know, been to the places where he grew up. I imagine a life for this man. My fictional character has a mirror name, Luisa, Luisa Mole. She's part Mexican, part Welsh. She's orphaned early in the, in the book. Her father was a Welsh fireman, fireman meaning demolition man, dynamite man. Her mother died of fever in the camps, which is a common occurrence. Here, very, very quickly, and I'm going to end on this, is an excerpt in which that shootout is told from Luisa's point of view. Luisa's over here in a house. As it happens, the father of the family who have adopted her is a businessman whose business is up there a couple of blocks at the top of Commercial Street. Um, his name is George Reed, and she has a, a girl's crush on George Reed. So the moment the shooting happens, her first thought is, he's over there, okay? After she put Pud down at his bedtime, Louisa sat on the steps to the front porch to catch the evening breeze. The girls were playing jump rope in the yard, and Mrs. Reed, her mending basket out, rocked and looked at the view of Fisher's Peak. The men worked late a summer Saturday. Louisa gazed across at town, the river. That was where they came from, pistol shots in quick succession. Pop, 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 pop. A ricochet of sound from buildings where Commercial Street fanned out above the river. What in tarnation? Mrs. Reed had stood. Pop, 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 pop. Louisa ran almost before she knew it, wind rushing past her ears, black hair flying. Behind her, voices screamed, Louisa, no! But no one followed as she crossed the thumping bridge, more people near, then running too, like her, both men and women. Then there were a crowd, and she stopped running. Motor cars and people jammed the street outside the union office. She saw the smashed glass of a shop window, the bullet holes and chips in the brick walls. A man lay on the street, holding his knee and cursing like a soldier. Another man lay twisted on a thick stream of his blood. Some women screamed. Policemen cleared away to get an ambulance to the wounded man. Louisa stood, relieved it wasn't George. No, it was George Reed standing next to her. What the hell are you doing here, young lady? He'd put his collar on, his coat and tie with its cigar smells. Sometimes walking home, he liked to smoke and maybe stop to drink just one with Arthur before he crossed the bridge. She felt him turn her from the sight and walk deliberately away, his hand upon her shoulder, steadying her shaking bones. Who was that man, she asked, the one who died? Some union fella came in on the train. I heard him having words with two mine guards or detectives or whatever the hell they are. He stopped and turned her toward him, and she saw worry in his blue eyes. It's getting worse, young lady. More union men arriving every week, more detectives. These fellows argued, I didn't see who started shooting. Now my point in using that excerpt at the end is that Scott Martell and I agree absolutely on the facts of what happened that day. We agree on the weather, we agree on the time of the day, we agree on what happened, who got shot, etc. But my intention is different. My intention, and this is in blank verse, by the way, which is, which is stolen from Shakespeare, um, among others. My intention is to give you some sense of the ground sense of these lives, uh, what it is like to be a person in these circumstances. Uh, this happens to be a teenage girl a few months before the Ludlow Massacre. There's the start of, of what I've got to say, and we'll see if there's more to say about it after. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And like a good dramatist, he's left us hanging. Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> the next presentation is what I used to call team, but now is, co is collaborative, I believe, is the proper term that's it's in vogue these days. And we have two people who are used to working together because they both come out of, a, of an institute, the Tory Honors Institute. And by the way, there's a table in the back, if you have not found it yet, that they'd love to have you visit. And they have some materials there. Um, we have here before us, we have Dr. Diane Vincent and Dr. Paul Spears, who work together frequently because, as I have come to understand, everything taught at the Tory Honors Institute is taught in a collaborative manner, which already means it has to be fabulous for the students. Uh, both of them work in, in a very different kinds of spheres, and you're going to learn more about, they said they will reveal a lot of what they do. Um, but Paul Spears is now director of the Tory Honors Institute, has been since 2012. He came to teach there in 1998. His own concerns uh, seem to be 
to, in what I can gather in getting briefly to know them, about mentoring students and teachers and dealing with the philosophy and the theology of learning and the classroom. His publications carry that forth in many different ways, and I suspect what he tells us will as well. Dr. Diane Vincent um, has her statement that I thought about so much as she said she was trained as a medievalist, actually at Cambridge, but she has become a generalist through great uh, experience in life, and that seems to be where her joy is at this point. Uh, very much uh, of her publications expressing the joy of the intellectual and the theological life, and she works in so many disciplines, anthropology, history, dance, choral music, uh, the generalist that she has uh, developed herself into being. And together they seem to do a lot of work and they're going to give us their um, their version of, and I don't even know, and I'm not entirely sure, there won't be some jazz improvisation here, which of course is what we would love to have in anything that brings the art of history to us. I'm going to try to change over the presentation. I don't know if we can use oh. Oh, are you are you in? Are you plugged in yet? Do you want it while they're dealing, or can are you able? Let's see. Do you want it? Would it be good to use this time with some questions right now, or do you think? I mean, we have said it good well until they're because they, you know, you know what this can be. It can be thirty seconds, and it can be five minutes. Do you Anybody want it? Has any questions about? This? Yeah. Yeah, um, some of them come from those same records. And there's a lot of, it's very interesting how much historical record there is. There are telegrams flying back and forth between John D. Rockefeller and his uh, minions in Colorado. There are newspaper stories. There are oral accounts, uh, some of the f survivors. I met the son of one of the survivors of the massacre. He's dead now I'm, as an old man in Denver. Um, and uh, his brothers and sisters were, were killed in the death pit. Uh, he was born after the massacre. Um, and uh, Zis Papanikolas interviewed folks like Mike Lavoda, John Lawson, et cetera, uh, who were there. And my father grew up among people who remember this. But that's, I mean, you know, Herodotus uses this information, hearsay, right? He says, I know this because the Delphians told me so, right? Um, and so that's one of the sources of history. There, there's documentation, there's paperwork, there is uh, documentation of, for example, the weather. Uh, records, weather records, and all that sort of thing. Zis Papanikolas located the autopsy report for um, Louis Ticus, so he found out he was indeed shot in the back. Uh, his body spun around and one bullet hit him in the side. His body lay on the ground for three days before anybody was able to move it. Uh, there are photographs of the bodies on the ground as the train goes by from Denver to Trinidad. So there's all that evidence. With Louis, with regard to Louis, I'm remembering living in Greece and I'm remembering what it's like. I lived in Greece pre-Europe, as you know, pre-1981 um, with the Pesach election that brought the European connection in. So I remember village life being um, a very simple, very local sort of thing. And I, I am imagining aspects of his childhood such as uh, skirmishes against the Turks. Crete does not become, have enosis uh, or union with Greece until about, anybody remember, 1913, somewhere in there, King George comes to Crete, uh, right? Thessaloniki is only captured in 1912. Greeks in Denver are getting on trains to go fight the, in the Balkan Wars. Um, so all that stuff is documented. I'm remembering, remembering, Nemosini, memory, is, is my muse to imagine uh, what it's like to be, to dream in Greek, and to wake to a world where your name is not Elias, you are not the prophet Elijah, you are Louis, Louis the Greek, um, and you're working in the mines, um, and you're finding out about these union guys who are saying this isn't right, um, right? So I'm using everything I can imagine about what it's like to, I, I, by the way, I was living with Scottish immigrants at the time, my former wife was Scottish and her mother I had the, the accents of Ayrshire in the house all the time. And um, so when, when my Scottish mother-in-law would say, back home, uh, whenever we had a full moon, that was when we went to visit the neighbors, that tells you a lot about the life in a village, 
no electric lights, etc. You knew you could get home, you could find your way at home because there was enough light in the sky to find your way home. That kind of detail for a writer like me is solid gold. That's where, that's where everything really lives. And I made use of all that kind of detail I can get from Greeks, from Scots people, um, etc. From my uncles uh, who told me all about what was happening in Trinidad in those years, what it used to be like, etc. So, um, and then Louisa, uh, I, I say this in my essay, but what I'm really doing is I'm building a character out of my own neuroses, my own psychology, which is a kind of hammered sense of identity, um, um, a sense of, of a divided self. Uh, and I conceive her as a somebody with a divided loyalty uh, between immigrants and, and other folks in the camps. And that's part of the dramatic tension in my story. I think I'm taking No, that's good. No, that's good. We want to use the time that we do have. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have all sympathy for uh, Susan Weiss Bauer, right? So she's having technical problems. I cannot judge her anymore because we have technical problems. But I'm going to just jump right in, all right? So our, our talk is called uh, Great Books and the Great Tradition, a Radical History. Um, so the modern academic discipline of history stands in contrast with the aims and modes of the Great Books tradition. Sometimes so much that the Great Books programs attract criticism that they don't really do history or at least don't do it right. Our goal today is to pass on a vision for a radical history that is not beholden to the norms and expectations of academic history, but gets at the root of what humans need and desire from looking to the past. The key tension that we are seeing here um, between academic history and the Great Books Projects is what we're going to start off by calling the problem of accounts. And these are a kind of a, a quick overview of some of the things that we hear uh, from colleagues, from other people, um, that, that are basically ways of substantiating the claim that great books don't do history. And the first one is it's a reliability issue. Great books can't deliver a reliable, factual account of the past. There's just too few of them. There's too little. They're, they're too narrow in that sense. So they have a narrow scope. Um, not only that in terms of what they're delivering in terms of the past, but even the, the book itself is not even giving you enough to deal with the book. So in order to write, really read Plato, really read Aristotle, really read Bronte, well, you need more contextual knowledge to even do that right. So we've of, often heard that the objection that great book students don't have enough contextual knowledge to even understand the book, let alone the culture that it's in. Um, and also, there's a, the, a third one is that great book students, great books programs can inculcate a real naivete, that students start making these broad generalizations off of a sort of like naive uptake of homework that they now understand something that they call Greek culture. Right, which, which is already mixed with Homer, who's already looking, you know, he's describing something prior to him, et cetera. So the idea is that, well, when you're looking to make accounts, great books don't give you an opportunity to do that, and moreover, they, they reinforce a sense of broad generalizations and naivete about history. And the common assumption behind all three of these is that history, what, hi what counts as history, is an accurate recovery of an account of a past event or culture. So history is about accounts, the right sort of accounts. And great books can't deliver those kinds of accounts, and therefore, they just don't do history. Right, so what's more, the problem of accounts bleeds into and is reinforced by an assessment definition of what really counts as success. Um, so we have goals, right? Students must master expert accounts of the past for learning to count, right? Um, so it's memorize, it's regurgitate, it's recount the arguments or consensus between historians, right? Um, kind of understand a historical taxonomy, that's the goal. Um, the mode, for example, is to be able to what? Say something like uh, Susan Weisbauer's read earlier, which is Bacon's Rebellion came about because of a change of oppression in Virginia. Right? So there, you talk about events happening, leading to other events that lead to other events. You've got to be able to recount those to actually be saying you're doing history. Um, and then the nature of the account is causal. It's thick. The more information, the more complexity that you can bring to the conversation um, from outside evidence, the better it is. Epidic epidictic, I can never say that word, um, which is like assessing 
the blame or praising the thing that happened. Um, making sure that you're historically literate, like you need to know about certain things to be historically literate. Um, those are just some of the, the pieces that we're always wrestling with when we're reading great texts. We're not doing those things. And then they're like, well, what is it then that we can assess? So the concern here is that the great books project will be thought of as a underserved or um, students will be thought of as underserved or historically illiterate if they can't produce the kind of account that's up here. Current assessment trends aim at this in order to avoid a chaotic, grab bag approach to teaching history, where the ends are ripe for politicization by whatever local powers that be, whose role it is to sift and represent these expert accounts. This is the problem of accounts. By another name and its goal, mode, and nature are entirely dictated by the shared assumption that history is centrally about the recovery of an accurate account of past events or cultures. And we dispute not only the narrowness, but ultimately the efficacy of this approach. It treats something ancillary and necessary as if it's the most central thing. There is great value. It's not supposed to be loud, it's just for the, the yeah, tape. Yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> it feels very much like a gesture towards recording. Yeah. There's great value in sharing accounts of the past together. We're not disputing that, but we're saying that there's a greater value in encountering it too. And doing this through great books is highly efficient and less encumbered by contemporary discourses and alien priorities. So rich, primary great books, we're saying, are the only things that root accounts in what could really count as a real human relevance. This is partly because these books are not merely giving accounts of what happened. Even great books that are doing history, Plutarch, Thucydides, Eusebius, are doing more than that. And we wanted to ex explore that for a moment just with a concrete example. And here is Thucydides. I would like to start to persuade you to consider Thucydides as a radical historian in the way that we're trying to advocate for and describe. Every reader of Thucydides accounts on the face of the text the moment you start reading a central question. Question, why read about hoplite warfare, ancient sea battles, and long dead bickering alliances? What does this, as this is the, not really what uh, Thucydides is doing, but the, the Chigi vase, um, but it's kind of a nice stand in, what does this have to do with anything that I care about? What do any of these things have to do? with something that Thucydides might want to say or tell me. Now this is not, a late, I think we hear these kinds of questions like what, what's in it for me, what's the relevance, and I think we sometimes take that as a lazy question or a way that's just trying to fob off work or interest or investment. Yeah, it's just a lazy, lazy question. But it's actually quite a serious question, both historically and philosophically. And it can't be quickly answered with a platitude that we have to learn from the past so that we won't repeat it. I think you, we already saw today how that's actually a whole notion of history that's coming in to kind of rescue us from history. Uh, we're better off coming to grips with this serious question starting off by actually reading Thucydides. Why does this matter? It, it's, a, it's a question, even when you pose it, you're already standing outside of Thucydides and looking at him as if you're a, an observer separate from him. You're standing outside the past and judging its relevance by some set of prior criteria that you're either holding consciously or unconsciously. Now this is even more naive than engaging with a great book without sufficient contextual knowledge. You know, you can, you can be woefully unequipped to read Thucydides, and we know that you can because we've watched people be woefully unequipped to read Thucydides, but you can do that and still gain a ton. So in that sense, these things, when you start to confront Thucydides, you begin to even ask the question in the right way. So the causes and the progress of the Peloponnesian War, those are really interesting on their own terms, but Thucydides claims his work is a monument designed to last forever. 
And he, part of the way he grounds this claim is he says, human nature being what it is. He wasn't interested in just understanding this war, but in standing war in general. And in that sense, Thucydides' work is not just a first of its kind, and that's usually why it's taught. Oh, he's the first one to do this. Um, but a great book, because he's a man in both action and contemplation. He thinks about war, not just reports it. He contemplates the logic of war, the theory of war, human motivation, psychology, power, justice, how policies affect people's moral behavior, how humans behave under stress and fear, moral philosophy, political philosophy. These are all part of his concerns. And as a work, as a result, his work invites contemplation precisely in the artful account and not sort of standing outside of it or just jumping off of it and leaving it. It's in the details that you're supposed to be, be con contemplating. Uh, giving our most careful attention to his work on his own terms, not on ours, gives us more than a long dead past. For his own terms are rife with reflection and insight about something more than just a sequence of events. When we read and discuss Thucydides' The Humanist, freed from any pressure, to outside pressure that we bring in to master a test of accounts, we can adopt something like a dialectic expectation that makes it possible for his questions to start to become our own. So one of the ways I posed this last semester in a lecture was getting the students to say, okay, should you be in love with the greatness of your own country? Do all patriots want to keep Athens great? The moment you put it that way, you, you think, oh, it's relevant. But it was cheating, too. There's a sense in which I cheated in a sense of the relevance just with the wording. But they found that when they started looking at Pericles' speech about the greatness of Athens, how you should feel about it, that, they, that, that sort of the whole contemporary political climate about America being great receded enough that they could give themselves to this question in a radically new way that they'd never done before. Well, yeah, but by disharmonizing with it as well. Right. Um, so th we find ourselves, by giving ourselves to the work of Thucydides, starting to care deeply, not about my translation of his questions, but his questions. Yeah. And even coming to start to truly ask his questions yeah. for me, like myself in a way that delivers more than just particular facts about ancient Athens. And our historical distance from him actually is really helpful. It powerfully works against immediately our narcissistic inclination to like immediately go to, how does this relate to make America great again? The distance, if you do it right, if you engage it in the right way, it still is preserved. Um, and it works against our narcissism. And therefore, we don't also start importing the answers we already have to our contemporary questions as if their Thucydides. So even in engaging with his question, we, we allow ourselves to leave behind the first platitudinous answer in our mind through the distance, because we feel ourselves bridging the gap across that distance. And that, in that sense, an alienation, a sense of alienation in the otherness of Thucydides allows us to contemplate a war, a war not just a war, but war alongside him, alongside him. So he's a radical historian. Right. Because his great book enables us to encounter the roots, that is the primary and permanent things, that consume human life, not transitory things. He aims at giving us an account of what it means of what has been, and he does this by contemplating it, not just by documenting it, right? Contemplating it versus documenting it. Only in such a way could he expect that it would be a work for all times and all places? So the primary mode of history turns to the roots. And by this, we don't simply mean the root cases, but the things themselves and their operations. For the things themselves comprise the only real connection that exists between past and present. The academic mode of history sometimes judges and forecloses on our projects because of the history guild's expectations. But all guilds are post hoc enterprises with respect to what they study. That is, they come after the root things themselves and serve the things to immerse students 
in the ancillary disciplines of history without helping them to dialectically encounter the things in themselves is to fail to educate them in history in ways that really deeply matter. History aims at answers, and we aim first to make the questions our own. And this is fundamentally what changes the nature of the encounter with history. So the way we tried to schematize this briefly is just here, by contrasting the difference between making an account by means of primary sources. And primary sources, you can, you can play with that definition as much as you like, narrow, wide. But the, the result is an account. And a radical history that we're trying to, pro, um, to propose to you here is one in which you encounter things in themselves dialectically by means of sources, primary, whatever. And, and we want to sort of propose that this is not naive, yeah. but principled. We don't pretend that we think we can really talk to Plato and find out what he believed or felt, or even like completely sketch out the contemporary context to which he might be giving a nod or responding to. But we do say that his work is so rich and coherent and compelling on its own that when you engage it deeply, you can turn, again, turn alongside Plato and share with him an object of inquiry in a dialectical sense. And again, this is, the, this is not just a problem for the past, it's also a problem for any time you're talking to a human. How it is that we're talking about the same thing? You really mean with them, right? Yes, yeah. alongside. You, you turn alongside with them and, and, and try to account and take and look towards the same object. So this is not just about the past. It's not, in that sense, it's not only legitimate, but it's necessary to engage history at all because this is how we share things with humans, period, dialectically. And what we're attempting to do here is to, again, go to the root, the radix, the thing itself, as our main point of access to history, because that's the main point of access to humans. Um, so one, one way we've, we've sort of launched off of this with something by um, Gadamer, to understand a question means to ask it, to understand meaning is to understand it as the answer to a question. That is, to understand meaning, we have to realize that it's the answer to a question, and answer to a question. Until we truly share the question, how could we say we've answered it? We've talked at it. We haven't answered it until we've shared it, until we truly share it. Our pedagogy is historical insofar as we understand meaning in this way, as to be an answer to a question that we have to come to truly be asking for ourselves. And that's the core of a dialectical encounter with the past and the present. Right, so we think the great books, we think the great books are the best means by which we encounter the past in this way. And they work far better than mere accounts because they merit a deeper, more profound kind of attention. And here are some of the things that we think that, that sort of establishes uh, great books. And that is that they're self-sufficient, right? These texts provide you with information you need, all the information you need to be able to understand them. They are self-contained pieces, right? Um, they are intercanonical. That is, they are talking to each other about each other without merely echoing each other or rejecting each other superficially or, superficially, um, or talking past each other with triviality, right? So they are within the flow of the great conversation. They are aware of people that have come before them. They are thinking that way. They may not directly identify them, but they are thinking about the great questions about what does it mean to be human? How do we get at these ideas? What has historically come before me? Right. Right. We also think that these texts are inexhaustible. That is, the books have a deep well of wisdom. And it continues as we return to it over and over again, actually becoming more rich and complex the more we have engagement with them. I don't know if you've ever been reading a book in class, you're working with some students, and you have an epiphany in the middle of class, like, oh my gosh, this is the thing that's happening. And your students are looking at you, and you're like, I, what? I'm still trying to figure out like the first layer. And you're like six down. And you kind of have to back out. But it's because your engagement with the text has returned to you in ways you couldn't even imagine at the time. And then all of a sudden, it pops up in a way you would have never seen before. Um, yeah, yeah, we can. Sure. So, so it, it demands a ton to us. That is, it evokes desires. And then it makes us do something with them. Right? Desires are necessary conditions. Like, 
I have to satiate myself when I'm thirsty. At some point, if I don't, I die, right? And if I actually satiate myself with the wrong thing, like salt water, I die, right? So it's actually pointed towards the right kind of return. And it's calling you, it's grabbing you, it's saying, no, you must contend with this idea. Um, Right. Right. So when so Augustine says something like, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, the question is, now what are you going to do with that? Right? The question is, if, you know, Aristotle's claim in Nick Ethics that good is what everyone seeks, now it's, now it's about contending with that, right? So these writers are attempting to say things that they believe are true and that demand your attention. Right. Um, and then we, we, we were trying to, so Di and I wrote this together, and we were having long conversations. And so we came up with narcissist resistant. I don't know how else to, to talk about it. Um, I like it that way. Um, so let me quote Gautamer again. Um, it is the essence of our reason and our spirit to be capable of thinking against what is to our own advantage, to be able to detach ourselves from our needs and interest and to bind ourselves to the law of reality. We think that's what these texts are doing. Um, they're not just about me, right? Um, Fred Lawrence says this on, about Gadamer. He says, um, by reason, we have the capability to acknowledge reality even against our own self-interest. And that's what you're coming in contact with, right? Um, it's to be taught even against our own subjectively certain convictions. That is the way of mediation of authentically historical truth. This is not just pure either. It's not, it's not that, this too. It's not that I can be objective and neutral and take that stance. It's I'm holding myself against my against the dialectical move. I'm holding myself against myself to some degree. I am capable of acknowledging against myself is the dialectical invitation. So again, it's, it's not a, a mere rehearsal of modernism, although obviously Gadamer's in that, um, and that's responding to that stream as a German, of course. We're not describing here a set of conditions that define what makes a great book, but a set of experiences that testify to just such a thing. D just such a text. What holds all these features in common is their mutually reinforcing ca capability for dialectic, both in the reading of the text and the conversations that we would have in and about them. So we wanted to say that great books, they're really good at staging and rooting these kinds of encounters, real encounters, but they don't do this by themselves. You can't just pop a great book in someone and hope for the best. They're not the object of inquiry themselves, but the way that we orient our, together with others uh, towards something, the deepest objects of concern that we all share, even though we share them with difference. Engaging with this way requires a pedagogy that aims at these encounters, these kinds of encounters. And in the remaining time, which is about 30 seconds, <laughs> we're going to describe this as much as we can. M maybe the, the, the thing to say here is the aim is to encounter things, not just the past or authors or even books. I'm not aiming to encounter the Republic. I'm trying to encounter with Plato something he's talking about in the Republic. Yeah, yeah so, uh, it's, see, so when we talk about things Ooh. like... Um, I don't know how to do this part fast. Um, it, it really is turning the turning of our conversation and therefore ourselves around a shared object of inquiry, right? A thing that we which we all need to come to grips with by continually returning to a question like, but what is it? It's a means of mutual orientation towards a shared object of inquiry combined with a refusal to be satisfied with a trite answer before the question is even understood, right? Students just want to answer, they want to move on. We're like, no, that is not sufficient. If you think in the first five minutes of class you've done this and let's move on to the next thing, you really are missing the project. Yeah. 
And you should actually use that as a moment of awareness for yourself to say, oh, right, something must be going wrong here. Yeah, in some sense, the students are always complain if you go in a circle, and I'm like, we went in a circle. Awesome, we're doing the right thing. That's the rec recursive element. You, you come around again. You would come again and return yeah. and again. And you can do this because the object is fundamentally simple. That doesn't mean it's not complex, but that it, it holds itself. It gives itself to you in a simple sense, in a receivable way. Um, by discursive, just real quickly, um, we mean something like, the, that's Eva Brand says that these kinds of things don't open themselves to strategic invasion. You actually get at them better if you futz around, which means that you, you don't try to get at it in this linear progressive way. You don't kind of open it up like you're trying to dissect a frog step by step by step. You actually take the time not to not know what you're doing because you're not trying to predict in advance how best to crack open this nut. You're trying to let the book lead you and guide you into it. In that sense, again, it's communal and dialectical. All these things, I'm just going to cut to the end of this part, all these things take time taking, they take patience, they take courage, they take confidence, they take friends, they make friends in the search for it as well. <laughs> yes, it's so Right, true. so you have these freshmen who are really struggling with trying to get at it. Then you go to a group of sophomores or juniors, especially in seniors, you're like, oh right, we're geniuses. Because it, it takes a while for them actually to get into the work. And so you've gotta be patient with the way in which it returns. And it doesn't always return in what seemingly is a really profitable way. But over four years, what you start to see is like, People come in and they see our seniors, they're like, what are you guys doing? We're like, we're mostly geniuses. They see what they're, we're doing with freshmen and they're like, what is wrong with you people, right? And that's, that's part of what we're saying is like, it's patience, right? Really, really patient. Just in, in closing, I think the benefit that we see here is inviting you to something that is, is rooted, that really defines a lot of how our human encounters work all the time, is that not only do you get better, obviously, at friendship, but you're encountering things that have an intrinsic worth that calls to people, that makes demands on people. And that once you do that, you're never the same. You never look at history the same. You never look at the life of an individual or an epoch or a people the same because now each one of those things is an object that could invite the same kind of standing alongside to see something that is both shared and transformative. And the last piece is what we were trying to do even by the presentation of our paper and even the work on it is to show you this in action, right? We, we actually worked for hours and hours in conversation about this and kept refining and, and wrestling with our ideas. And I know we got to places we could not have gotten on our own. And we're not done. And we're not done. Yeah. Thank you. Dance here. Show me the other stickers over in the room. Um, I'll just hold it. Yeah. Those have been waiting to the end. Let's see if we can turn it around. Questions? Sorry for the speed. Yeah. I'm trying to do this better the second time. Yeah, so we have a friend of ours um, who, who is a historian, who actually is a historian of, of Middle East history. And we were asking him, like, what should we add to the canon? And what, how should we think better across, like, different cultures? And, he's, and we said, what do, you, what do you think we need to do? And he goes, I don't think you need to do anything. And here's why he said that. I mean, the Arab Spring of a few years ago, one of the things that the, they were all reading was Hamlet. And they wanted to talk with people that had read Hamlet because they're like, wait, it speaks to our condition. And so there's something about the nature of these texts that sort of transcends cultural limitations, right? And you're like, oh no, I know what it means to be oppressed. I know what it means to have my authority or, or my rights usurped. Oh, how do, I, how do I navigate that question? Oh my gosh, someone else has written about this. It's radically accessible to me. And he said he remembers people just sort of like saying, oh, you, you speak English. You must have read Hamlet, right? You need to talk with me about it. Yeah. Um, if you come, I think it's three o'clock, to the panel that Fred Turner is speaking on this afternoon. He's going to address the issue of epic, but he's got a handout that involves epics from all over the world. Um, a sort of a very much a multicultural idea. I've taught post-colonial literature as well as Western literature and Greek literature over the years, and they can interface quite beautifully. There's a lot of good stuff you can yeah. use.
Yeah, we're, we're actually doing a current course now where we're reading, um, we're reading the Quran in that course, yeah. I forget. Um, Confucius, Analects, we're reading a bunch of ancient Near, Near East texts as well in our course. The reason is, I think, the, the, the other thing, I, did, I would turn your question upside down, what should we do in light of this thing? I, I think it's similar to what happened to primary sources. They went from being a small number of privileged sources to like a wider sense. Yeah. You kind of got more there there. I don't think we need to change the criteria of Western and non-Western. We need to we need to basically access longer lists of the things that are there because that you don't need a list to tell you what to read. The book will like when you find the book, it will tell you. Yeah, that's right. It will exactly give itself right. to you. Yes or no. And the better you get at reading, the better you get the dialectic, the better you get at being able to give yourself and receive from any object, regardless of its cultural but it's history. More than just prescriptive lists, yeah. right? hero, he's also the author, and the poem is the foundation stone of the building of the city. So the, the idea of the story as a civic building block is right there at the beginning of the poem. All right. Nothing like a mellow event, right? I think I'm, I'm going to show, I have a handout, yeah. old-fashioned yeah. style. Yeah. Uh, I if there's anything else in here, like a recipe or my, <laughs> my uh, trip case, my bank account, please disregard. And everybody happy with fifth gear? Because we may need to do sixth gear. We'll see. That's fun. Um, OK, and I actually had this clicker. Thank you. It's, these are also on the digital commons or whatever the proper name for the resources are. And let's see what we can do in 10 minutes here. Um, music historiography. Fashionable scholarship and serendipity, uh, which is really what explains a lot of things that happen of great importance. Uh, I wanted to talk at, about how we've ended up with our musical canon. And by that, of course, I mean these guys. You know, these are the ones, especially in my generation, that you had on your piano. You can't believe what they cost nowadays. They used to be like cheap, not anymore. Um, and the three Bs, remember? Who are they? Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, right? Which I always thought was weird because for all kinds of reasons. We pick one from each century, one from each period, with Beethoven, of course, being the most appealing because he was the least appealing, at least personally, and perhaps the most powerful. So when you get into the musical canon, the fact is we all grew up with some exposure, most of us, to so-called classical music. Uh, that term in itself we could talk about forever. But uh, who's in the club? And that's where the, and why are they in the club? Uh, you could say that about everything we all do. Which battles? Why don't we know about Ludlow? You'd think we would know that before we would know some incident that happened 2,000 miles away, right? But we don't, and it was right under our noses. And now someone is bringing it to us. So the canon is obviously flexible, but in music, it pretty much got set. And I want to quickly say why. And not only your Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, and of course you're going to get Mozart and Haydn in there. Surely they get there somewhere and handle. And those other guys get there, don't they? is the question, and what's Chopin doing in there? This guy, you know, he's a Pole. Where's the rest of our East European? Remember, there was no wall. There was no Cold War. The most extraordinary thing I think you can do with looking at music in the past is look at the, the trade route, route, if you will, the time lags of how people like Liszt, how people like Handel in his own era to become a, an international superstar by his more modest standards than we would have today. How did people go? Where did they go? These are gigging musicians. They have to make a living. Even when they had royal patronage, they were sent to other courts. They had an active life. They went places. There are no borders. There was nothing between, for lists between Istanbul and considering going to New York. You know, it's just wherever the money was, people went. So what? how do we end up with Chopin being the guy that many of us first heard is the classical music that many of us may have even fallen in love with and led us to want to take piano lessons? He's not even in this club of these other guys, right? He's not part of that. Did somebody decide to let one Slav in? Perhaps that's what happened, right? Okay, well, this story is too too big, obviously, to, for, as all of our stories, as all of our stories. But in the handout, I'm suggesting to you some resources. These are the things that happened. And this follows so well with what Susan was speaking about today. This positivism where suddenly with training, with scientific approach, this is what happened in the 19th century. I'm not going to go back to the medieval period, obviously, in our time limits here. But there was an explosion of publications trying to get this, which is the Bach manuscript, 
which and, and first of all, you've got to value it to publish it. That's part of the, the equation. Into something like this, the Bach uh, Gesamt Ausgabe, which, and please note that most of what's going to be on your handout will be German terms. It will be the Germans who will own this game, who will make the decisions, the Austrians, the Germans, the German speakers, even though the language of music is what? What country? Italian. Everybody knows that, right? Where does music come from? It certainly doesn't come from, from Hamburg. Thank you. It comes from Italia. You know, it comes from the heart and passion of Italians. And yet it will be German scholarship that will decide, uh, not even aware that they're doing it, the canon that we all inherited when we turn on our classical radio stations, uh, if they still have those where you are. The second thing to consider is the role of musical biographies and something that was spoken about, of course, by, with Susan so beautifully this morning, um, that one of the things to remember about music is that unlike art that is tangible and that we have and that increases or disappears in value. You know, there are very few things in music that sell for $60 million. And there are loads of things in art that do. You know, the, the value of music is something that cannot be marketed the same way as, as, as art. And you would expect to find, and many of you may be familiar with this very important 1550, 1551 uh, publication of uh, Vasari's Lives of the Artists. This is considered the first biography in the fine arts and he had it's not just one little book it's huge uh, huge by those times with about 50 people in there most of whom were his friends Leonardo people like that make it in and a host of people we've never heard of today who were the the pop artists of those days. You have to go 200 years later for music because again, music is ephemeral. One of the most important paintings of music showing Schubert's, uh, the typical salon setting for a composer like Schubert, right? Where music was there, it's not here. If I sing to you, you have music. If I don't, you don't. You know, we have music in our head. We can't hold it, we can't pocket it. I can't give it to you exactly. And so what do you do with it? And so it takes really literally 200 years longer before you have a biography that even remotely resembles Vasari, and it would be Handel. It's one year after his, after his death in 1760 because he was an Italian, French, and English superstar. He was Mr. International. He was Christian Dior. He was, he was the guy in 1760, a year after his death, even during the last part of his career. So very famous. And who comes next? 1802. You see what a big gap that is? Bach, Forkel's biography of Bach, which is, again, considered monumental. Yes, there's a little dribble here and a little drabble here, and nobody's even singing or playing Bach, and yet there is a biography of Bach that's considered important in what we will call the Bach revival. Very quickly, keeping moving, we could go through when does someone get to Beethoven, when does somebody get to anybody, but it takes time because it's music, and it's not art, and it's not literature, and it doesn't seem that biography is, is going to be the mover and the shaker. The big thing that will be the mover and shaker in terms of developing our canon that we still have to this day is going to be number, number three, publications number one. Biography, mm, some. Three, this whole 19th century fashion for revival of early music, which was a humongous uh, hit. It had a whole lot of movers and shakers. Some of the more famous people are uh, Carl Friedrich Zelter, who was the teacher of Mendelssohn, who he really put the first Bach, St. Matthew's passion, interest into, into Mendelssohn. He basically said to Mendelssohn, hey, Felix, you're talented. Let's get some of this stuff back in the Zing Academy in Berlin. Let's start performing this music. Bach had not disappeared, but it had been sort of an inside thing where the well-tempered clavier was something I practiced on my clavichord, then my forte piano, and I hand copied her, or my student, or my, my slave, or you know, my somebody hand copied it, and I gave you a copy, and you were fascinated by Bach's fugues, and you gave him a copy, and it kind of had a life, and people knew about all the music, and in the church, the cantatas were still circulating within the Protestant world, but they certainly weren't out in the performance, and then these guys worked together, you end up in 1829, with the first performance of the Bach B minor Mass in Berlin in the Zing Academy. I mean, you talk about a hot dog event, because it certainly was. You talk about, you talk about people being floored. You talk about a score that was inaccurate. You talk about something that needed some serious editing, but who cared? People walked out of there going, holy mackerel. And from that point on, you have the Bach revival unto this day with all of the refinement that those guys would not recognize. Another big movement, if you get curious about this, is the St. Cecilia, or well, Sicilian movement, which was a revival of 19th, in the 19th century, second half, primarily French, of church music. Now, 
church music hadn't gone away. Chant was still there in the Catholic Church. And chorales of Bach and his many, many people who were more successful than Bach ever was were still there in the Protestant Church. And Italian polyphony, Palestrina, and everybody else in that club. But in terms of it being current and important and, and something we want to relish and we want to deal with and we want to get out to the public, no. Until this marvelous movement that you can check out if it's interesting to you in sacred music, Sicilian movement. And suddenly, of course, what will happen? Publications, biographies, performances. Otherwise, music does not exist, all right? Uh, in terms of this type of music. Yes, okay, moving on. Personalities have had a lot to do with giving us our canon, too. We could look at someone like Ma Wanda Landowska, one of the greatest women in music ever, harpsichordist, initially pianist, who rediscovered the harpsichord, who basically took a harpsichord to Russia and played it full Tolstoy, dragging it through the snow. When she, she's a little woman, when she got out, it literally covered up to her nose, but she got to Russia with her harpsichord to play Bach for Tolstoy. That's a heck of a trip to think about right? And Wanda Landowska was in the era of recordings, so we have her recordings. We have her take on Bach, and she was one of the many people putting a fashion in music together. Many other people we could look at. What did Toscanini care about? That's what everybody cared about. What about Stokowski? That's what everybody cared about. What about Kusevitsky? That's what people, he being a modernist and interested in modern music. So when we had the personality that drove music, and it there wasn't this division with classical for the elites and everybody else doing whatever. These guys were stars. These guys would have been on People magazine covers in their day. They were the equivalent. So that which these stars, these personalities cared about in an era where you didn't need the internet to know what was going on, that is the repertoire that suddenly mattered. And we can extend this up to what happened with Bernstein, who basically is considered the guy that, gave, that brought back the Mahler symphonies. Now, Mahler. Mahler, horn players, they'll, cross, they'll crawl across glass to play Mahler symphonies, right? But Mahler before Beethoven was, yeah, oh yeah, Mahler. You know, what happened? It had to happen through the passions of a man like Bernstein. So personalities being a factor. And finally, five, the transformative role of recording. Suddenly there was a tangible way beyond those scores. And I give you in this handout, by the way, wherever the thing is, a way more than you would ever want to know. I'm sure you're going to memorize all of this. I can see everybody drilling one another. But seriously, um, I give you the terms for, uh, it, just let's see if I'm going fast is fun. Um, if you're on the back, these were the early attempts to take and make complete works that did not actually quite get past. Sometimes one volume, sometimes two pieces, sometimes six volumes. You know, who knew? A lot of things that would have been in, say, a, a Handel complete edition weren't even by Handel. You know, it's going to take a couple of generations for people to get in and figure out who actually wrote what. They borrowed from each other the way you borrow flour and eggs from your friend, you know, if you still do that old practice. Um, and it was considered a compliment. So all kinds of things editorially have to be sorted out. So then you look at actually editions. No need to give you all the details, but look who gets a complete edition, so-called complete edition. And there's the crowd with Chopin in there, you see? And the story of how that happened we can tell over lunch. But it had to do with someone actually making the decision of, here, you're carrying the groceries, could you carry my tennis shoes also? You know, it was a very much an anomaly to have this slob, because his career was in Paris, but it wasn't that important a career. Yeah, the music's gorgeous, so was a lot of other people's music gorgeous, but Chopin got anointed. He got to wear the cap. He got in the club, and to this day, that is, you know, why we, we don't think about it now. Of course it would be Chopin. No, definitely, there was no of, of course about it. It was very much a, a kind of a fluke, a serendipity. Gretry, huge name, we don't most know it today. There are other names that we could look at, but this tells you the stream of publications coming out of that period that Susan was talking about, where suddenly the scientific side of music was full of gas. The gas tank was overflowing. You had a powerful horsepower, and everybody's cranking out these editions, and they are bought by a subscription. People are people like you and I are buying them for our home libraries. It was a fashion. Um, this thing about monuments is interesting I, I, on the front page because then going along with again with what Susan was so wonderfully putting out early. The national schools began create, creating what we would call anthologies, anthologies of their music, anthologies of their own countries. Uh, with one Slavic entry again, you see you see the um, uh, Musica Antica Bohemica, looking at ancient Slavic chants, and, uh, Gregorian chant and early polyphony in the Czech, in what we call today Czech, Polish, Romanian world. But again, it's going to be the musical garden. The titles are wonderful. The Brits and the Germans and the Austrians, they're on it. 
these things went into 60, 140 volumes. You go to a good music library, and you will see them filling row after row. Do we need them today? No, we've got digital everything. But when they came out, they were revelatory, and they had so much to do with national musical identity. Now, last thing. Oh, I'm gonna go, okay, and then I'm done. Uh, Recordings, we know the good and the bad and the ugly, right? Suddenly, you don't have to pay no me, so me. You don't have to do squat to get music. What do you have to do? You turn a crank. You know, and that sounds hard now. Now we push a button. Now we think to push a button. Probably Now we say, Alexa, give me music to relax by between 1820. I mean, now, who knows where this is going? Drive me nuts, but it is what it is. It is forming the future. I just had someone telling me about the, the virus. Someone just texted me, my goddaughter, and she says, this is what Amazon is saying we should do. And I'm going, oh my goodness, but enough of that. The point is, you don't have to do anything but push a button. Once you can push a button, you can't do great books anymore. You can't go back and do what you do anymore. Pushing a button, you know, I could put all the world's can canon of music probably on a flash drive. So what? Does it mean I can hear anything? Does it mean that I know the melodies? Does it mean I know anything about the harmonies? Does it mean I know why something blew the musical world open like Rite of Spring or Beethoven's uh, Third Symphony or any of the other things? So what? Nobody was asking so what because we could now have it and buy it and take it home with us. And so what really opens up? You can't see that's a split. You know, the ground is coming up. And you end up with a split. You have the musical canon, particularly in light of the 1940s, 30s, late 20s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, avant-garde, atonality, 12-tone, the academic side, the ivory tower, taking over new music, new composition, and essentially running the audience out the door, right? I still have people, when the work that I do in my own, out my own world, I work a lot with groups out of the, uh, touring things with Smithsonian, and I have people say, oh, Schoenberg, new music. I'm going, honey, that guy's been dead so long. You're talking 1910. You know, come on, it's 100 years ago, let's talk about it. Don't want to even hear the name. Don't want to hear the name. You drove audiences away. The modernism drove audiences away. They didn't have to go far. You had the pop world. You had the American songbook. You had Broadway. You had Gershwin. You had this glorious tradition. We didn't need to be pummeled with European avant-garde if we had our own great stuff. And I can buy it no longer in sheet music only where I have to play it, but I can put it on a, a machine and spin something, and then I get cassettes, and then I get, you know, I don't have to do anything. It's mine. This divide has been terrible for what we call classical music. It's been terrible for the economics of it. It has run generations away from the musical canon and shut them out, and one of the most sad and wonderful things, the end of it, is that the good news is that's changing. There is hope Ladies and gentlemen, I work a lot with ensembles. I work a lot with groups. I still go, I live in North Carolina now, but I go to Dallas a lot and other places. The composing that's going on now, and the Dallas Winds, 85 to 90% of their repertoire is written in the last 20 to 25 years, much of it in the last 10 years, and they are piling them in. Sometimes we have 14 student bands coming in in any one concert. And composers like Eric Whitaker, who has created a virtual choir with up to 1,000 different people singing the parts and the technology putting together each of their voices and he conducting them with solos possible. All this cool stuff, melody, harmony, beauty, excitement, taking the best of everything that the human soul needs in music and bringing it back. There is a movement afoot and it will that divide that I just showed, I actually believe that divide is going to heal. It's going to take 50 years, but it's on its way, and I'm actually very optimistic, and that is enough to say. 